It's an urgent warning. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our show today, an imminent Black Swan event is threatening to trigger global chaos. Now, Black Swan event is something nobody can see coming, but in this case, the entire global equity markets can see it. The problem is they don't believe it can happen, and they're betting heavily it won't. And when you do that, it creates the recipe for all-out global chaos that could send global equity markets crashing. I'll show you what the event is, and we'll see if the markets are on the right side of this train or not. Plus, we have a sponsor for today's show. We'd like to welcome EMP Metals to the show. You can find them on the CSC under symbol EMPS and on the OTCQB under symbol EMPPF. And the reason you want to check them out is because their stock is on fire. It's rallying and you got to be in it to win it because we think it's got another 20% to go. They're an early entry lithium exploration and development company. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now, let's over to Bloomberg, where he picked today's story up as traders need Fed's rate cut signal to keep stocks rallying because this is the black swan event. The market now is pricing in an absolute certainty that the Fed will cut at its next meeting in mid-September, and investors have piled in in a big way. In fact, in yesterday's show, we talked about how machine positioning is going to start buying into this market and it's going to pull money in. The question is, what? What is the event that could send markets crashing? If traders hear cuts are coming, stocks will react favorably, and that is generally true. If we don't hear what we want, that would trigger a big sell-off. Because right now, the equity markets and investors believe that the Fed is going to achieve this Goldilocks scenario of a soft landing. Now, keep in mind, historically, the Fed has never achieved a soft landing, not even once. But this time, the market believes it, and they're betting big on it. And let's take a look, because we do see some effect of of a planned Fed rate cut, or at least the belief that one's coming, does send stocks higher. We can take a look at the NASDAQ 100 here in red against the federal fund rate in blue. And what you can see is there was a pullback going to the dot-com bubble and stocks rallied on the belief the Fed would and then later did cut rates. It happened again during the global financial crisis. But look at this, heading into the pandemic, the Fed aggressively cut rates. It sent stocks higher until the pandemic hit. Of course, in the stimulus, kicked off a big round of buying but notably the key here is you'll see in the charts what happens in the early stages of bear market stocks don't reach their prior all-time highs but with all the machines set to be buying here over the next couple of weeks and investors bullish about the market and corporate share buybacks at high levels it could push equity prices to new highs but there's one person that could tip the scales in the opposite direction and we'll find out soon enough on Friday Friday. As markets are so confident that rate cuts are coming very soon, it would be a huge surprise if Powell didn't reinforce that's the path ahead. Because again, the market knows the economy is slowing, but they believe a one cut or maybe even two, a second one down the road is all the economy needs. Because they bought into the narrative that the Fed can control the economy through the funds rate, even though we know they can't. We're going to look at some more details on this. The question now is, will Powell kick off a black swan? event or not because that surprise could threaten to up in the s p 500's furious 3.3 trillion rebound after a global growth scare in early august sparked the worst sell-off of the year bulls have since regained control with the equities benchmark on a seven session winning streak as investors plowed five and a half billion into u.s equities in the week through wednesday and based on today it's continuing higher and likely to continue that trend but that could go the other direction on Friday, as we will soon hear from Fed Chair Powell. And but the real question is, by September, what could come out in the data that could change everything? We'll look at that in a moment as the Fed chair will likely imply that tight monetary policy is no longer warranted. This from, of course, Bill Dudley, the former head of the New York Fed. But he doesn't expect Powell to signal the size of the first cut, particularly since there's a jobs report on September 6th for central bankers to consider before their next policy decision on September 18th. And now it sets up one of the biggest potential risks that we could see out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, because if they put out an unexpectedly large non-farm payroll report, 
Well, that would change the market's perspective at a time when investors are leaning heavily and buying massively, particularly with leverage into stocks, and that would be the black swan event. His tone is crucial if he shocks the market as hawkish. Well, stocks will react negatively. Well, that is for sure, because is this about the consumer price index? Because is this a case where Powell is going to look at the markets and look at the economic data and say, you know what, I really want to see stocks rallying here because we've noted in the past when the Fed has tightened in, you know, policy by raising interest rates and unwinding its balance sheet, that Powell really wanted the stock market to go down because he believed it would bring consumer price pressure along with, of course, the wealth effect lower. But is that any correlation to that? Well, not really at all, because we can look at periods where the stocks are rallying as we come back to the NASDAQ 100 in red, this time against the consumer price index in blue on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And we can find several instances where stocks are rallying and inflation is going up. And there's some other ones here that aren't highlighted. But you'll notice, broadly speaking, there's absolutely no real correlation between the two. But there is a very strong correlation between the markets and the labor market. As we now look to the unemployment rate, perhaps this being the reason why the Fed chief may give the markets what he wants to give them to keep the rally going, because what is unexpected here is the unemployment rate has risen above the 4% target that Fed Chair Powell put on the table. Actually, he said it's going to be somewhere around that, but now it's at 4.3%. And look what happens when the unemployment rate continues to go higher. Well, that means we're in the early stages of a bear market, which would be where we're at right now. But if the unemployment rate comes down, well, that sets the stage for a further rally in stocks, giving some credence to the fact that a rising equity market may give employers confidence that spending will follow and may be the real reason here that this time Powell says time for stocks to run and gives them the quarter percent rate cut they want. To be clear, traders fully expect a rate reduction at the next Fed meeting, but they aren't sure how big it is. And with a few officials scheduled to speak in the coming days, the stakes are high for Powell's remarks. This is why options traders expect the S&P 500 to swing over 1% in either direction on Friday based on the cost of the ought the money puts and calls. And yes, Fed Chair Powell will speak at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We will be there, of course, live with all the news as we normally are every day. In fact, we're there right now just to get a seat at the front of that table. Because when we look at what the market's pricing in, you can see two year treasury yields are really giving the Fed all the power to cut rates here. Because as we look at the funds rate in blue against two year treasury yields in red, you can see that two year yields lead the fund rate in virtually every instance. The Fed doesn't cut rates without the market telling them he wants it. In fact, this cycle, we saw two year treasury yields dip. The Fed said no. They came back down again. The Fed said, said no a second time, the third time here, it's highly likely, particularly since the last meeting where the Fed chief, you could tell he wanted to cut, but he couldn't because his members of the board did not want to go along with it. The odds are this time and the market's pricing in a quarter percent cut. But will they get a half a percent? That's what some people are really hoping for. The highlight will come Friday when Fed Chair Jerome Powell speaks about the economic outlook in a keynote address at 10 a.m. from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. With the U.S. Central Bank approaching a crucial pivot point, it's difficult to overstate how much attention financial markets will be paying. Well, don't worry. They're going to be paying a lot of attention anytime the Fed chief speaks, the markets around the world stop. Because if he signals that perhaps the labor market is going to turn around and it's gaining strength, well, that would send equity markets going the opposite direction because, again, nobody's betting on the odds that the Fed doesn't cut in September. For starters, they're looking for confirmation the Fed will lower rates in September, but more drama surrounds what happens after that and the pace of additional cuts over the next several months as the Fed confronts the dual risk to both inflation and employment. And now we start to see why the market gets nervous here because they want the Fed to cut so desperately because they believe in the soft landing scenario. They actually realize the market or the economy that is, is headed into a recession, but it needs to get some cuts on the books to save the economy. Otherwise, what we have is just what we see at every peak. Investors overloaded in stocks saying they'll never make this mistake again. But once again, here we see the Fed facing a cut 
into the weak economy. The only question then becomes is how weak will it be by the mid-September meeting? And Fed's Kashkari says a weaker job market should open door to September cut. And we start to get the picture now with some of these headlines and what these Fed speakers are saying is they are getting nervous about the job market. The fact that the unemployment rate went up to a level beyond their expectations is every bit of the warning sign that the market is ignoring. And Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari signaled he would be open to lowering interest rates at the central bank's next meeting because of a rising possibility that the labor market weakens too much. The balance of risk has shifted, he said, so the debate about potentially cutting rates in September is an appropriate one to have, and he's absolutely right about this. In June, Kashkari said he had thought a rate cut might not be warranted until the end of the year, but the rise in the unemployment rate to 4.3% July from 37 at the start of the year points to greater risk of an undesirable slowdown because there's really two ways to get inflation down, and the easiest one is to actually put people on the unemployment line because their incomes go down. And in a period of relatively high inflation, rising insurance costs, higher energy prices, consumer spending will outright collapse in that event. And the Fed won't have an inflation problem. What they'll have is a recession problem and even worse, a financial crisis to deal with. Because we can see the relationship here, here between the funds rate that's shown in blue and the unemployment rate, that's the U3. As we can see, as the U3 heads higher here in red, what happens, the Fed does start to take notes, not initially, but as it moves up, they start to cut rates. Of course, we'll get an update on the U3 in a couple of weeks, but you can see this increase here is setting up historically everything the Fed would want to see. You've got two-year yields coming down. You've got unemployment rate rising. That's everything the Fed wants and the market needs. The problem is the market believes if you put in a quarter percent cut or maybe in a half a percent cut total, that that's everything you'll want to turn the economy around. What we do know historically, that doesn't happen. And what it means is we're in the early stages of a recession now, despite the fact that equity markets are pushing right back toward all time highs. And still, Kashkari said he didn't see any reason to lower interest rates in increments of larger than a quarter percentage point because layoffs remain low and claims for unemployment benefits don't suggest a normal deterioration. The problem that he doesn't realize is when the labor market starts to fall apart, it's slow at first and then it's all at once. And we're not at that event yet, but we could be there soon. Now, will we be there by mid-September? Probably not, which is why we're going to get that likely quarter percent cut. But if for some reason the data turns around. Maybe the BLS puts out a very hot non-farm payroll report with a plan to revise it down lower later. Well, that could tip the Fed into the favor of a no-cut move, and that would send equity markets around the world crumbling. And without that evidence, it'll probably be in the camp of, hey, let's take a more measured approach because we don't know where our destination is going to be. Never better spoken by a Fed speaker. Again, once again, admitting that they have no clue what they're doing here. In this case, he doesn't know where monetary policy needs to be. They're just guessing and hoping. If we saw some quicker deterioration in the labor market, and that would tell me, well, we need to do more and quickly to support the labor market, even if we have uncertainty about where our ultimate destination is going to be. And keep in mind, the Fed is the first to tell you that monetary policy works with long and variable lags. The problem is the market believes that only applies when the Fed raises rates. They believe in when you lower rates, it's an instantaneous effect. Well, if you've got a long and variable lag on one direction, guess what you have on the other? And that would be the reason why the markets want to cut, but it just doesn't work. And as far as the odds of the non-farm pay report looking hot, well, unless we're seeing the BLS cook the books, the odds are it's not going to look great. Here you can see the unemployment rate, which leads the non-farm pay report. That's shown in blue in terms of change of thousands of persons. And what you can see is as the unemployment rate rises in red, what you do is you have a decelerating and then eventually a contraction in the non-farm pay report. But it's going to take a little bit more than where it's at to put that in contraction territory, but we will be closely 
really watching the revisions because what we've noticed is the BLS has been putting out numbers that are above average of what we have expected. And then in the months after, heavily revising them down, that is the risk here. They could put out a big number. Everyone will focus on that. Meanwhile, a lot of they downwardly revise the other ones. This will be one of the most important non-farm pay reports in a very long time. And Cash Kari said he wasn't convinced that the Fed's rate setting is as restrictive as some claim. He pointed to a low level of layoffs and a more resilient housing sector as evidence. But that isn't a reason, he said, to keep rates where they are. I'm still unclear how tight policy is. Now, he should know this because he's on the board. If they actually knew what they were doing, he would know exactly how tight it is, but they have no idea. Because the balance of risks, in my view, have shifted more toward the labor market. Well, they have, and away from the inflation side of our dual mandate. And that's what happens, Kashkari, when you put people on the employment line. Well, that means inflation is coming down. And now General Motors is on that track too as they're going to lay off more than a thousand salaried software and services employees and you start to get the picture of why the fed's worried here because the last represent about 1.3 percent of the company's global salaried workforce and that is dangerous as the cuts come as automakers attempt to reduce costs that's not inflationary and in many instances, employee headcount amid fears of an industry downturn as they're spending billions of dollars on emerging markets such as all electric vehicles and so-called software divine vehicles. And here's the case. Auto manufacturers are seeing a slowdown. The Fed's seeing a slowdown. They're getting nervous, but they can't panic in front of the markets despite the fact that U.S. leading economic indicators have now plunged for the 29th month. This is worse than it was during the COVID lockdowns. And here you can see Again, 29 straight months. This is dangerous. Here's what the leading indicator said. In July, weakness was widespread among non-financial components. A sharp deterioration in new orders, persistently weak consumer expectations and business conditions, and softer building permits and hours worked in manufacturing drove the decline together with the still negative yield spread. What this is indicating is the U.S. economy is getting worse, not better. There's not even a sign of a soft landing here, but don't tell equity markets that they believe it. These data continue to suggest headwinds in economic growth going forward. The conference board expects U.S. real GDP growth to slow over the next few quarters as consumers and businesses continue cutting spending and investments. U.S. real GDP is expected to expand at a pace of 0.6% annualized in Q3 2024 and 1% annualized in Q4, validating the downward trend of the economy and that we're headed right into a recession. But one thing that is rallying right now, and that is the stock for our sponsor for today's show, EMP Metals. You can find them on the CSE under symbol EMPS and on the OTCQB under symbol EMPPF. And get everything in the pinned comment and description below because we heard this week from Goldman and they said over the next month, they believe stocks can rally here. Machines are going to be buying and you're gonna see the tide raising all boats. This is one we think you can cash in big as we're showing a potential 20% upside target. Wait till you see the chart. But why EMP Bells are an early entry lithium exploration and development company focused on large scale direct lithium extraction assets in low political risk jurisdictions in North America. Their highly experienced technical team with vast experience in building large scale brine lifting and disposal infrastructure have the proven ability to significantly advance quality projects. Let's take a more detailed look because EMP Metals is exploring and developing lithium brine assets, helping to address domestic critical element supply chains. The seasoned project technical team possesses deep resource experience to advance its strategic property package and lithium testing on vertical wellboard at the view field and Mansour properties have converbed high flow rates and brine concentrations. And let's take a look at the market and numbers here. By 2026, the global lithium market is predicted to be worth $91.9 billion and is projected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 19%, making this a big opportunity to invest in the space. In 2019, the automotive industry was the largest segment with a revenue share of 40.8%, and lithium demand is anticipated to reach 600 150 kilotons by 2025, a growth rate of nearly 600% between 2019 to 2025 in the EV market alone. And how about the Saskatchewan Advantage, a mining and business friendly province with accessible oil and gas infrastructure. Saskatchewan provides considerable local social support available for extractive business such as EMP. 
in addition to contain an underutilized workforce experience in the extractive industry with access to extensive geological data the provenance promises success for lithium extraction and that means success for emp stock and emp metals has three projects in the southeastern saskatchewan area and let's take a look at some of the recent press releases as emp metals begins operations to direct lithium extraction and pilot plant partnership with coke technology solutions and saltworks technologies in southern saskatchewan the facility represents the first coke technology solutions DLA pilot skid to be commissioned and operated in canada and they have also acquired rock resources interest in saskatchewan lithium assets and they entered a share exchange agreement back on August 7th with Rock Resources, where Rock will exchange its 25 common shares of Hub City Lithium, a private entity, in return for shares of EMP Metals. As a result of the transaction, EMP Metals will own 100% of the issued and outstanding shares of Hub City Lithium, which wholly owns the Saskatchewan Lithium Properties. And they've commenced summer drilling program in Southeast Saskatchewan this here on the 13th. You wonder why the stock's on fire. You can see that EMP Metals is making all the right moves as they have now announced commencements on two well lithium drilling and testing programs. And this is fantastic news. Something we think, again, is going to send the stock up another 20%. Let's take a look at this chart set up here because you can see the stock came down into the supply zone and buyers came in here and bought and that's how you know that where a stock tends to bottom because buyers come in there and you'll notice how fast it moved down from the upper supply zone here in the middle all the way down and that suggests the stock will rally right up into it which it did but we believe it will likely hold support as we believe that EMP metals is on the move sending it potentially 20% higher into this upward supply zone and that is a huge opportunity for them again you can find them on the CSE and the symbol EMP and on the OTCQB under symbol EMPPF. But as always with any company we feature on our show, be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.